Good morning and welcome with us to church this morning. We're going to sing uh, some songs together this morning, so we invite you to stand with us. But this first song is about the joy we have as a Christian because uh, the God of the universe is actually for us. He's uh, starting a good work in us to carry it to completion. And, and that is something that should bring a welling of joy into our hearts. So stand with us and we're going to express that joy. Give praise to the Lord.
God's word today is from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4, verse 14 through to chapter 4, verse 5. Beginning in verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Repro reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The word of the Lord for us today. Thank you so, so much, worship team, for the ministry of music, and thank you so much, Bob, for reading scripture. Again, we want to go to the Lord in a word of prayer this morning as we pray for ourselves, as we pray for the things that we're facing. Just a couple of requests uh, before we do pray. Pray for those who are in mourning. There are many people in our church over the last uh, few months, the last year, that have suffered the loss of loved ones. They're still in the process of grieving, so we want to make sure we're praying for them. Pray for those that are still in isolation or in our seniors' homes. We've got all kinds of people that are still in that situation for grace and peace in this difficult time. Pray for those that are struggling in our church, struggling spiritually, uh, perhaps in marital problems or emotional or spiritual, uh, financial, and pray for wisdom and grace uh, for us as God's people to persevere. So let's just go to the Lord this morning in a word of prayer and ask him to be with us and to strengthen us as his people. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning only because of your goodness and mercy and grace, only because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. We want to thank you and praise you so much for your kindness towards us. We thank you, Lord, that, that you're a sovereign God, that you're sitting on your throne, that you're in control of every single detail of our lives, that we can come before you, Father, with boldness, not with arrogance, because we understand who you are. We understand who we are. Uh, we can come before you with boldness because of what Christ has done for us, Father. We thank you that we've been justified by his blood, Father. We've been uh, declared righteous because of what he's done for us in his life and death and resurrection. And Father, we come before you just to worship you this morning, to praise you, to cast our cares upon you. We do pray for those in our congregation today, Lord, that are still mourning the loss of loved ones. Father, we do pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them and watch over them. Uh, Lord, give them the grace to keep on running this race. Give them the grace, Lord, in the times of, of great sorrow to turn to you and to find in you all the strength they need to continue to walk in a faithful way. Father, we pray for those who are in our seniors' homes, who are, uh, Lord, still in, in deep isolation, families not able to come in to see them. We pray that you would encourage them and, and strengthen them, Lord. Watch over them. Give them the grace to put their trust in you. For those in our church who are struggling, Lord, perhaps, uh, financially, Lord, because of maybe loss of work or for those that are struggling perhaps in their marriages, Lord, that you would be with husbands and wives and give them the grace, dear Lord, to be the men and the women that you've called them to be. Uh, Father, we pray for those who might be sick, that you would touch their bodies. But most of all, Lord, we pray that you would touch each one of our hearts. We pray that you would draw us closer and closer to yourself. Give us the grace to deal with sin in our lives, Father. Give us the grace to live in submission to Jesus Christ, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We glorify you as we continue to worship you this morning in song. As we listen to your word being uh, preached, Father, you pr we pray that you would move in our midst, move in our hearts, and draw us closer and closer to yourself. We'll give you thanks and praise for that, Father, in Jesus precious name. Amen. What is 
Sovereign. 
Thank you so, so much, Matt and worship team, for that ministry and music. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, please turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. I just want to read those two verses before we go to prayer. I do want to thank Fred for having preached the word last week. I, I do trust that you are deeply encouraged. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, very familiar text. It was read earlier on by Bob, but let me just read it again. This is all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's just go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you this morning and we just pray now that as we come before you, your word, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to me. I pray that you would speak to us. I pray, Lord, that this would not just be another religious exercise, Father. I pray that we would hear exactly what your word has to say to us. I pray that you would change us. I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that you would strengthen us. I pray that you would give us the resolve we need to love you with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. Father, we need your grace. We need your help. I need your grace. I need your help. Bless this time, I pray, Father. Bring glory to yourself. Strengthen your people. I pray that you would be uh, glorified in everything we think, say, and do. And I pray, Lord, uh, that you would just continue to speak in Jesus' precious name. Amen. On March 18th of this year, I wrote you a letter as we began a time of self-isolation due to COVID-19. It was a letter in which I meant to encourage you during these difficult storms of life that we're currently facing. Now in that letter, I asked you to commit yourself to the following five very important things. I asked you to pray, to read the Scriptures, to give, to encourage, and to evangelize. Things that should characterize the normal Christian life. Now, the last time that we were together, we talked about a couple of those exhortations. We talked about prayer. We talked about giving and encouragement. And this morning and for the next few weeks, I want to continue doing this. And I want to speak specifically on the need that we all have to believe the Word, receive the Word, and obey the Word. I might end this little brief series with a message or two on the exhortation to evangelize. And so for this morning, let me begin by addressing the subject of believing the Word. George Mueller, who is well known for his strong faith, once said, The first three years after conversion, I neglected the Word of God. Since I began to search it diligently, the blessing has been wonderful. He said, I've read the Bible through 100 times and always with increasing delight. He said, I believe that the one chief reason that I've been kept in a happy, useful service is that I've been a lover of Holy Scripture. It's been my habit to read through the Bible four times a year in a prayerful spirit to apply it to my heart and to practice what I find therein. I have been for 69 years a happy man. Happy, happy, happy. John Bunyan, the man who wrote the classic novel of Pilgrim's Progress, once said this, Read the Bible and read it again, and don't despair of help to understand something of the mind and will of God, though you think they're fast locked up from you. Neither trouble yourself, though you may not have commentaries and expositions. He said, pray and read, and read and pray, for a little from God is far better than a great deal from man. The Bible is a treasure house of God's wisdom. It's our hope, our light, our food, our strength, our sword, our peace, and even our life. Our very own statement of faith says this, We believe that the 66 books of the Holy Bible, both Old and New Testaments, were written by men who were verbally inspired by the Spirit of God. The Bible is a perfect treasure of heavenly instruction. It is God as its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It reveals the principles by which God will judge us, and therefore is and shall remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and opinions must be tried. Amen. And praise God. Stories told that the distinguished Bible teacher James Gray once gave the following illustration to emphasize the importance of reading the Scriptures if we're ever going to grow deep spiritual roots in the faith. 
He said that when he was a young Bible teacher, he became deeply impressed by the peace and spiritual strength of a friend of his with whom he'd often talk. Since James wanted to have that same kind of peace, he decided to ask his friend for the secret of his confidence and positive outlook. And his friend said this. He said it all started through reading the book of Ephesians. Well, James was shocked by his friend's remarks because he himself had read through the book of Ephesians many times, but he'd never experienced the same strength or peace that he'd noticed in his friend. And when his friend saw the puzzled look all over his face, he went on to say this. On one occasion, when, when I was on a short vacation, I took a pocket edition of Ephesians with me. Laying down one afternoon, I read all six chapters. My interest was so aroused that I read the entire epistle again. In fact, I didn't lay the epistle down until I had gone through it about 15 times. When I got up to go into the house, I was in possession of Ephesians, or better yet, Ephesians was in possession of me. He said, I had the feeling that I'd been lifted up to sit together in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, a feeling that was entirely new to me. It was that testimony of his friend that encouraged James Gray to begin to master the scriptures for himself. He began to saturate his mind in his heart with the truth of God's word, and he found himself getting stronger and stronger in the faith. His study of the Word of God not only had a powerful effect on his own life as a believer, but his entire ministry was also transformed. He was able, by God's grace, to communicate the Word of God with more power and with greater effectiveness. Spurgeon once said, I think it's well worth repeating, I would recommend that you either believe God up to the hilt or else not to believe Him at all. Believe this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it completely. There is no logical standing place between the two. He said, be satisfied with nothing less than a faith that swims in the depths of divine revelation. A faith that paddles around the edge of the water is a poor faith at best. It's a little better than a dry land faith, the kind of faith that isn't worth too much. If you and I are going to be the men and women that God has called us to be and that He has saved us to be, then we need to understand that this will never happen in our lives apart from the means of grace that God has given us in His Word. Friends, God sanctifies His people. That is a promise, but He doesn't do it in a vacuum. In His wisdom, He's designed and decreed specific means of grace by which He accomplishes this glorious purpose. And one of those means of grace that God has given us, is the blessing of His inspired, infallible, and inerrant Word. We will never grow in Christ if we fail to give ourselves over to a diligent study and application of the Word of God in our lives. If we fail to appropriate God's Word, then we'll have the kind of faith that Spurgeon spoke about, a faith that paddles only around the edge of the water, a dry land faith, a weak faith, a hungry and thirsty faith, a failing faith. The Bible says, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Well, that's what I want us to think about this morning. We gather together as God's people because we believe the Bible. We believe in the God of the Bible. We believe in the Christ of the Bible. And we believe in the message of salvation as it's taught in the Bible. We believe this book's every precept, it's every promise, and it's every threat. We hold up our Bibles and say, this book is the divine word of God. It is completely true from cover to cover. We believe that it's the very inspired, infallible, and inerrant word of our sovereign King. I believe that every single one of you who are hearing me this morning would all agree that the Bible is indeed very unique. There's no other book like it. It's the only one of its kind. It's superior to anything else ever written by the pen of men. This book, the Bible, is, is a book that was written over a period of 1,500 years by over 40 different authors consisting of kings, military leaders, peasants, philosophers, fishermen, tax collectors, poets, statesmen, musicians, scholars, and shepherds. 
It was written in many different places at many different times and by people who were experiencing all kinds of different circumstances. It was written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. It was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. It was written in many different kinds of literary styles, including prose and poetry and historical narrative, romance, law, biography, parable, allegory, and prophecy. And it addresses hundreds and hundreds of difficult issues without ever once posing one single contradiction. It's a book of great diversity, and yet, in spite of all of that, it unfolds one single, continuous story, and it does that without ever contradicting itself. Now, I think that we'd all agree that the Bible is indeed a truly unique book. There's no other book like it. But we need to understand that its uniqueness was by no means an accidental thing. It was purposeful and planned. God inspired this book by His Spirit through the agency of human authors. We saw that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It is breathed out by God. Now friends, if God has done this, if He's given us His Word inspired by His Spirit, then it stands to reason that the Scriptures He's given us are absolutely perfect. They're completely trustworthy and entirely authoritative. We can believe them. We can trust them. We can place all of our hope in them. Instead of misleading us, the Bible will always enlighten us. Instead of betraying us, it'll always protect us. Instead of destroying us, it'll always comfort us. And instead of leading us astray, the Bible will always guide us and advise us. That's the treasure that each one of us has received from the good hand of our God. And so what I want to do then this morning in this, in this message in light of all this is to give you a brief survey on the nature of biblical inspiration from the following three different perspectives. First, the process of biblical inspiration. Second, the proofs of biblical inspiration. And third, the product of biblical inspiration. So first of all, then, I want us to consider this thought, the process of biblical inspiration. Now, what was the method that God used to get his word into the hearts and hands of men? How did God do that? How was this work accomplished? But what, by what means did God communicate his divine truth to us? Well, the answer to those questions is threefold. God did these things by revelation, by inspiration, and by illumination. So first of all, God accomplished these things by revelation. He chose to make himself known to man out of the riches of his goodness and grace. He didn't have to do that. God was not under any obligation to make himself known. He could have remained completely silent. He could have kept himself hidden. The choice was entirely his. Revelation always finds its origin in the grace and goodness of God. Now, having made that choice throughout history, God has revealed his word to man in three specific ways. Number one, he revealed himself to man through what we might call God's words of personal address. Now, there have been times when God communicated to people on earth by speaking directly to them. They actually heard his voice. He spoke to them as we would speak to one another audibly, distinctly, intelligibly, and plainly. And we see all kinds of examples of that kind of revelation in Scripture. God spoke to Adam face to face in the Garden of Eden. He spoke to Abraham in the Ur of the Chaldees. He spoke to Moses from the midst of a burning bush. He spoke to Isaiah in the year that King Uzziah died. He spoke to Jeremiah when he called him to be a prophet to the nations. And he spoke of his son Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration when the disciples themselves heard God say, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Those are all known as God's words of personal address. In every single case, when God spoke audibly to men, it was very clear to the hearers that these were the actual words of God that they were hearing. And those words were trustworthy. And they had complete divine authority over their lives. You couldn't argue with them. You had to surrender to what God was saying. To disbelieve or disobey those words would be to disbelieve or disobey God himself. Now second, God also revealed himself to man through what we might call God's word is speech through human lips. 
Now, many times in Scripture, God raised up prophets through whom he spoke, and he revealed his mind to them. He revealed his will through them. And once again, it was very clear that all of these were human words spoken by ordinary human beings in ordinary human language. They were still, nevertheless, the very words of God himself. And they were binding and authoritative in all those who heard. The Bible says this in Deuteronomy 18. I'll raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone doesn't listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything that I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, he must be put to death. Now, even though this is primarily a reference to the prophetic ministry of Jesus Christ, it still applied to all the prophets that followed Moses. God put his words into their mouths, and they spoke what he commanded them to say. Now, God's word through the prophets was authoritative and binding. He spoke through Moses, Samuel, Nathan, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, and the list goes on and on and on all the way up to Malachi. In every single one of those cases, God spoke to men through a man. And his word which came through human lips was just as binding and as authoritative as if they'd come from his very own mouth. To disbelieve or disobey those words, again, would have been to disbelieve or disobey God himself. Which brings me to this third point. God has specifically revealed himself to man through his word in written form. Written form. Yes, God has spoken to man face to face. And yes, God has spoken to man through the agency of men. But now, God would reveal his mind, his purpose, and his will through the writings of the apostles and the prophets. Now you see the first instance of God's word in written form when God himself wrote out the Ten Commandments with his own fingers on two tablets of stone. We then see it in the writings of Moses and Joshua and Samuel and David and Solomon and all the prophets. And then finally in the writings of the apostles. And once again, we need to understand that God's word in written form is the very word of God himself. And his word in written form is just as binding and as authoritative over us as his words of personal address. To disbelieve or disobey these words is to disbelieve or disobey God himself. And that is a very important point to stress and to understand. The Bible is God's word. Now, Secondly, in answer to the question, by what means did God communicate his divine truth to us? Not only do we need to understand the nature of revelation, We also need to understand the the nature of inspiration. The process of God's word being transcribed in written form is known in theology as the process of divine inspiration. It's that process by which men wrote down onto paper exactly what it was that God intended them for right. You see that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now somehow, God superintended the process of getting his word into a man and then threw that man on the paper. The doctrine of divine inspiration has often been defined as God's superintendence of the human authors so that using their own individual personalities, they composed and recorded without error his revelation to man in the words of the original autographs. As biblical inspiration. But how did God do this? How did he superintend the human authors so that what they wrote was exactly that which he had purposed them to write? Well, there are all kinds of different views when it comes to the nature of biblical inspiration, but only one of those views is right. Let me share a few of them with you this morning. First, there's the view of natural inspiration. And that theory suggests that there was nothing supernatural at all that was involved in the writing of the Scriptures. Those who hold to that position would argue that the writers of Scripture were inspired in the very same way that Shakespeare or Milton or Dante were. 
They would say that the Holy Spirit was not involved in the process whatsoever. Now, obviously, that cannot be the correct view of biblical inspiration. Secondly, there's a view of spiritual illumination. And that theory tells us that it was the authors themselves who were inspired by God and that inspiration only affected their writings in an indirect way, not in any real way. And so the Bible isn't God's Word. God inspired the writers, not the Word. That, too, cannot be a proper understanding of biblical inspiration. And then there's the view of partial inspiration. And that theory suggests that only some parts of the Bible, only those parts that are related to faith, are inspired by God. So these people are convinced that the Bible is full of historical and scientific errors, but that God has preserved the message of salvation for us. Now clearly, friends, that cannot be the proper view of biblical inspiration because if we can't believe some parts of the Bible, then how can we believe any of it? It's like Spurgeon said, believe this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it completely. There is no logical standing place between the two. And then there's a view of conceptual inspiration. And that theory suggests that only the concepts of Scripture are inspired, not the words of Scripture themselves. The argument is that God simply gave man an idea and that man in turn wrote down his own thoughts about the idea that God had given him. But how can that be right? I mean, the Bible clearly says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, we've not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit is from God that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. It's not only the concepts or the ideas that have been inspired by God, but it's actually every word of Scripture that's inspired by Him. And then finally... There's also the view of divine dictation. And that theory would suggest that God dictated what the authors had to write as though they were purely passive men, like a pen in the hand of an author. They believed that the biblical writers were merely puppets in the hands of God, that he came upon them and he overrode their minds and their thoughts and experience and circumstances, and that none of those things had anything at all to do with the formulation of Scripture. But we know that that can't be true because the writers of Scripture were real men who were facing real problems and often wrote about their very real experiences. I mean, just think about David and the Psalms. Think about the Apostle Paul and all those letters that he wrote to the churches. Think about the fact that some of these authors of Scripture actually investigated things before they began to write like Luke, the doctor, did. And think also about the fact that all the authors of Scripture wrote with different literary styles and vocabulary. They're all unique. So none of those views of the nature of biblical inspiration are right. We don't believe in natural inspiration or in partial inspiration or in conceptual inspiration or in spiritual illumination or divine dictation, but we believe in the verbal and plenary inspiration of the Bible. Listen, guys, we believe that all of Scripture, every single word of it, was divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. We believe that every single part of the Bible is God-breathed and that God used men to write down exactly what it was that He wanted to communicate to us. And so the vocabulary and style might have been the authors, but the message is entirely from God. Louis Burkhoff says it like this. The Holy Spirit acted on the writers of the Bible in an organic way, in harmony with the laws of their own inner being, using them just as they were, with their character and temperament, their gifts and talents, and their vocabulary and style. The Holy Spirit illumined their minds, aided their memory, prompted them to write, repressed the influence of sin on their writings, and guided them in the expression of their thoughts, even to the very choice of their words. Praise God, that is what we believe. And having said that, friends, I need to stress the fact that although these words are given to us in written form through human agencies, they're still nevertheless the very words of God himself. And they carry the same authority and truthfulness and power and promise and hope and life and light and peace and warning as God's words of personal address. 
To disbelieve or disobey this book is to disbelieve or disobey the living God himself. And that is a very serious mistake. Now let me ask you a question before we continue. What are some of the benefits that come to us from having God's Word in written form? Let me suggest three of them. The first one is this. There's the benefit of preservation. Because we have God's Word in written form, there's a much more accurate preservation of God's words for future generations. We don't have to rely on memory or on the testimony of oral tradition, which are so much less reliable than the written word. We have the written word of God right here in our very own hands. And the record of his word ensures an accurate and precise preservation of God's word, not only for us, but even for our children and for their children and for every single generation that will follow. Praise be to his holy name. And not only is the benefit of preservation, but there's also the benefit of inspection. Because we have God's Word in written form, the opportunity for us to, to repeatedly inspect those words allows us to carefully study them, and, and we can talk about them. We can memorize Scripture. We can meditate on it. We can teach them and preach them and apply them into our daily lives. And this, this will lead each and every one of us into a deeper knowledge of God and of man and of sin and of salvation. It will confront us for who and what we really are, and it will point us to Jesus Christ. The only answer and hope to our great spiritual misery and death. Guys, what better hope is there for us than that? We now have the privilege of, of being able to inspect the very mind of God. Now, number three, there's the benefit of accessibility. Because we have God's word in written form, it's true that's far more accessible to people than words that are preserved merely from memory or oral tradition. The Word of God can be studied at any time, by any person, in any place, in all kinds of different languages. God's truth is no longer limited to a prophet or to an apostle. Each and every one of us has equal access to the mind of God as His mind has been revealed to us in Scripture. God did at one time speak to man face to face. He did at one time speak to man by putting his words into the mouths of his prophets. But now, listen, God has spoken to us by his word in written form, inspired by his spirit, so that you and I might enjoy the benefits of preservation, inspection, and accessibility. And praise be to him for that glorious gift. Hallelujah. Well, I've got one more point of this first heading of the process of, in, of inspiration. We've talked about revelation and inspiration, but let me just say a few words about the nature of illumination. That's the process by which God uses the inspired record of his word in Scripture to speak to the hearts of men. See, the Bible tells us that the unsaved man cannot understand the things that come from God unless the Spirit of God illuminates his mind and his heart. It says, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because these are spiritually discerned. It's the work of the Spirit. And the work of the Spirit alone to take God's Word and to cause His light to shine into the hearts of men. You and I lack the power to do that. We can't convince men of their sinful misery. We can't convince them of their desperate need to be saved. We can't open up the minds of their understanding to the place where they see their own sinfulness before the infinitely holy God and reach out to Jesus Christ as their only hope. I mean, we long to do that. We pray for it. We teach and preach and witness with that single aim before us, but we can't do it. We can't give life to those that are dead. That power doesn't lie within us. Only the Spirit of God is able to regenerate and illuminate the hearts and souls of fallen men. That's why the Lord says this in Isaiah 55. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that yield seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I said it. God's word has power 
to bring life. It is living and active, the Bible says. Luther said it like this. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. And so what was the process that God used to get his word into the hearts and hands of men? He did it in three ways. He did it by revelation, by inspiration, and by illumination. Well, let me now move into our second major point, the proofs of biblical inspiration. Now that we have some idea of what inspiration is and of how it is that God communicated his word to us, how can we be really sure that the Bible is indeed inspired by God apart from its own testimony and witness? Are there any tests that would lend some type of credibility to what God has said about his word? Well, ultimately it comes down to an act of faith, does it not? We've got to believe that. But faith is never a blind leap in the dark. It's never walking around in a room with your eyes closed. There's a substance to our faith. There's an essence to our confidence. Our faith doesn't only rest in the fact that God has personally breathed out his word in written form through the agency of human instruments, but it also rests in the fact that God's word will stand up to several important tests as to its divine origin and uniqueness. Let me suggest five of them. Number one, the Bible passes the historical archaeological test. For so many years, people laughed at Christians who believed in the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture because the Bible referred to places and to people and to events that had no basis in recorded history. But that's no longer the case. Through archaeology, many items have been uncovered and unearthed from, a- from the ancient past that have clearly confirmed the facts that are recorded in Scripture. There's not a single piece of evidence that's ever been surfaced that contradicts what the Bible says historically. Let me give you a couple examples. For years, men said that a place called the Ur of the Chaldees didn't exist. But now there's proof that it actually did. The fact that Joseph ruled in Egypt was confirmed by a tablet that was found in Yemen. A clay tablet was found in the tomb of a rich woman who recorded her efforts to buy grain from a man named Joseph in a land called Egypt. The seal of Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe, has been found. Jezebel's makeup saucers have been found. Bricks in Egypt that that have been found that were made without straw. And the death of Jesus Christ has been proven to be historical fact. There's so many others that we could bring up, but these are given to show you that the Bible has been and continues to be proven accurate in every single one of its historical details. We can trust God's Word. And then the Bible passes the scientific test. So many people have mocked God's Word and they've claimed that it's woefully inadequate in matters relating to science. I wish Bruce Kovac was here for this point. I mean, he he could do a much better job expositing this point than I could. Once again, time has vindicated the inspiration of scriptures. In Isaiah 40, verse 22, the Bible says that the earth is a circle. Man discovered that truth in the 15th century. In Job chapter 26, verse 7, the Bible says that the earth is suspended in space. Sir Isaac Newton discovered that fact in the year 1687. And in Genesis 15, verse 5, the Bible claims that the number of the stars are innumerable. We now know that there are trillions and trillions of stars in the universe, far too many for us to even record. There's so many other scientific realities that were spoken of in God's word long before men ever discovered their truths. But again, these are given to encourage us to put our trust in the veracity and inspiration of the scripture. And then the third test is this one. The Bible passes the prophecy test. There are literally thousands of prophetic predictions in the Bible. And some of those prophecies are are dramatic in nature. For example, listen to this. The prophet Isaiah mentions Cyrus, the king of Persia, by name, by name, at least 125 years before he was there, ever even born. You see that in Isaiah 44, verse 28. Isn't that amazing? Not one single prophecy that's been made in Scripture has ever failed or will ever fail to come to pass. And some of the most remarkable prophecies are those that are related to the person of Christ. I mean, if we were to just take a few of the most specific prophecies concerning Jesus, we would quickly discover how astonishingly accurate the Bible really is. Listen to just 17 of those prophetic statements. Micah 5 verse 2 tells us that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. 
Isaiah 40 verse 3 tells us that he'd be preceded by a forerunner. Zechariah 9 verse 9 says that he would enter Jerusalem on a colt. Psalm 41 verse 9 tells us that he would be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 22 16 says that his hands and his feet would be, would be pierced. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says that he would be wounded for his enemies. Zechariah 11 verse 12 tells us that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Isaiah 50 verse 6 says that it would be spit upon and beaten. Zechariah 11 verse 13 tells us that the money used to betray him would be thrown down into the temple and used to buy a potter's field. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says that he would be silent before his accusers. Isaiah 53 verse 12 says that he would be crucified among thieves. Psalm 22 verse 8 says that people would gamble for his clothing. Zechariah 12 verse 10 says that his side would be pierced. Psalm 34 verse 20 says that not not one bone of his body would be broken. Psalm 16 verse 10 tells us that his body would not see decay. Isaiah 53 verse 9 tells us that he would be buried in the tomb of a rich man. And Amos 8 verse 9 says that darkness would cover the entire earth. Every single one of those prophetic predictions came true in the life of Jesus Christ. Who can stand there for this morning and tell me that the Word of God is not true, that you and I cannot put our trust in it? Who can say that? You know, someone once calculated the odds of just these 17 prophecies coming to pass in one man's life, and they said that it's one chance in 480 billion times 1 billion times 1 trillion. That's the number 480 followed by 30 zeros. In other words, it would be like taking a grain of sand, painting that grain of sand gold and hiding it somewhere among the 200 million stars and the millions of planets and moons and asteroids of the Milky Way and then blindfolding a person and sending him out to find that golden grain of sand. It's just not going to happen. It's impossible. Even if you were to take just eight of the prophecies that refer to Jesus Christ, it can be illustrated like this. Suppose you fill the entire state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars and you marked one of those silver dollars with an X and you blindfolded a man and you allowed him to go anywhere he wanted to in the state of Texas, stop wherever he wanted to, and then reach down into the silver dollars and pick out the one that had the X in it. The odds of that happening are one in 100 million billion Friends, my whole point is here is this. Can the Bible be trusted? You bet your life it can. We can believe it. We can rely on it. We can rest and rejoice in the truthfulness of it. It passes the prophecy test. Number four, it passes the unity test. All of Scripture is united in its theme and its message. From Genesis to Revelation, God unfolds his redemptive plan through Jesus Christ. In spite of the fact that it took over 1,500 years to write the Bible by over 40 different authors who had different backgrounds, different experiences, different levels of intelligence, the Bible, friends, is the unfolding of one single story from beginning to end. Man could never duplicate that. The Quran and every other religious book that religious leaders have ever produced could never make that boast. We can put our trust in the Word of God. And then finally, the Bible passes the honesty test. If this book... This book that I'm holding right here in my hand was merely a human book. It would gloss over all of the failures of the most prominent people that are found within its pages. But the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't sweep any of those facts under a carpet or hide them somewhere in a corner for no one to see. It doesn't hide Noah's drunkenness or Samson's lusts or David's adulteries and murder or Elijah's depression or Jonah's rebellion or Peter's denials or John Mark's weakness in forsaking the Lord's work. It doesn't hide any of it. It tells the truth from cover to cover. It exposes all the weaknesses of men, but the even greater grace and mercy of God. Praise His name. The Bible passes every single test that has ever been put against it. No human book could ever do that. The conclusion then is this. It finds its origin in God himself. 
This is His inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. And you and I, beloved, can believe it. Praise God. Well, let me close our time together this morning by addressing our final point, the product of biblical inspiration. I'm going to be very brief here. We now have some idea of, how, of what inspiration is and of how it is that God communicated His Word to man. And we've seen that the Bible has been able to stand up against the many tests that have been thrown against it. <clears throat> but what does all of this mean? What does it mean? If we accept the Bible as God's inspired Word, which we must, then what can we take away from our study? How does this change our lives? What impact should this truth have upon the manner in which you and I conduct ourselves in this world? Well, first, let me say that we have to come to the conclusion that if the Bible is inspired, then it must also be infallible, inerrant, incapable of making any mistakes or of being wrong. We can trust everything it says. Doesn't that bring such great comfort to our souls? The Bible will never lead us astray. It'll never deceive us in any way. All of its promises are true, every single one of them. We don't have to be afraid of what life might throw at us. We can believe everything that God has said. We can bank our souls on the truthfulness of His infallible Word. There's nothing that can happen to us in life as dreadful or as difficult as those things might be that falls beyond the dictates of God's sovereign will, wisdom, power, faithfulness, and mysterious goodness. Nothing at all. We can rest. We can rejoice. Listen, we can pick ourselves up from off the ground, dust off all these battered and beaten bodies of ours, and press on with great hope in the unfailing promises of God. They alone sustain us. I know that many of you are suffering this morning. Many of you are hurting. Many of you are distressed and full of fears and anxieties. Many of you are so deeply confused about the circumstances of your lives. You're beginning to question the goodness of God. You're doubting His wisdom and His faithfulness. You're unsure of His divine and eternal love for you. Everything around you seems to be pointing to the fact that God is so indifferent, that He's inactive and inconsistent, maybe even unjust. You feel in the deepest part of your soul that He's abandoned you, that He's left you on your own, that He doesn't really care about you, that God takes pleasure in drawing out your tears. You look at the brokenness of this world. You look at the loneliness of your life. You look at the stinging hardship of your confused heart and you compare all of that to what the Bible says about God, His goodness and faithfulness, His kindness and mercy and grace, and it simply does not measure up. It doesn't make any sense. It seems so contradictory. And you feel like giving up. You feel like dropping out and turning away. You feel like leaving the faith behind. But you have forgotten one very important thing, dear beloved saint of God. What you hold in your hand today is God's inspired, infallible, and inerrant word, and you can believe it. You must believe it. You've got to lay hold of its truths and let those truths anchor your soul. With Asaph, you've got to say, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. But for me, it is good to be near God. I made the Lord God my refuge. With Isaiah, you've got to learn to say, for my thoughts... Are, your, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And with the Apostle Paul, you've got to learn to say, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? who's given a gift to him that he might be prayed for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We've all got to learn to say that. 
Why? Because in spite of all that our circumstances might seem to be telling us, the Bible is God's inspired, infallible, inerrant, and very near word. It can be trusted. His promises will all come to pass, even in the darkest moments of your life. We walk by faith, don't we? Not by sight. We can trust Him. And second, let me close with this. We also have to come to the conclusion that if the Bible is inspired, then not only must it be infallible and inerrant, but it must also be authoritative. It's binding on us. It's binding on all of our lives. I said this several times throughout this message. To disbelieve or disobey the written word of God is to disbelieve and disobey the living God Himself. And that's serious. In all the years that I've been a pastor, in all the years that I've counseled men and women and young people, and even those that have been older than me, and have pointed them to the Scriptures and to what the Word of God has clearly demanded from their lives, only to have some of those very same people harden their hearts and close their minds and figuratively plug their ears and turn from God's inspired, infallible, and inerrant Word to go their own way, believing that God approves of their actions has been the greatest sorrow of my ministry. All of my pleas and prayers and petitions have not moved those loved ones to repentance. I've so often sat there and wondered, how can you tell me that you love God, that you fear God, that you desire to please God, that you want to bring glory, honor, and praise to His name, and yet when you're confronted with what the Scripture says, you disapprove, you refuse to listen, you will not bow your knee, and you sit in judgment on God's truth and make excuses as to why He won't hold you to account for your willful disobedience. How can we do that? Jesus said it plainly. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. And Jesus said this, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do we hear that, beloved? Do I hear that? Do you hear that? We cannot play games with this. If the Bible is inspired, then not only must it be infallible and inerrant and bring great comfort to our souls and praise God that it does, but it must also be authoritative. It is binding on every single one of us and on all of our ways. But the question is this. Are we listening to Him? Are we listening to our God? I have so much more that I could say this morning, but I'm going to end right here with Spurgeon's words. Listen. Believe this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it completely. There is no logical standing place between the two. We have God's Word in written form. Beloved, let us believe it and submit ourselves to it. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you and praise you that you have never left us without a witness. Lord, you spoke to men face to face. You spoke to men audibly. You spoke to men through the words of the prophets. But now, Father, you have spoken to us by your word in written form. None of us are without excuse. We can claim your promises. We must listen to what your word says to us. We must submit ourselves to its divine revelation. We can put our trust in your promises, and we must bow our knee to your commands. Father, I pray for myself. I pray for those that are listening to me even now. Give us the grace to love your word. Give us the grace to read your word. Give us the grace to study your word and to meditate on your word and to apply your word into our lives. Father, no matter what we face in life, whether they're trials or temptations, give us the grace 
to feed ourselves upon that heavenly manna, this written, inspired word that you've entrusted to our souls. We'll give you thanks and praise for that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ, hallelujah, Jesus is my was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you had not loved me first, Thank you so, so much for joining us this morning in our worship service. I do pray that the Lord will give you and me all the grace we need to keep on running the race that is set for us. He's given us His Word. He's given us His truth, something that we can stand on. So, beloved, no matter what you're facing before you right now, you need to put your trust in the Lord. Let's close our service off in a time of prayer and trust that God will be with us in the coming week. Let's pray. Father, thank you and praise you so much 
For the time we've had together this morning in worship, we thank you, Lord, that all we do have is the Lord Jesus Christ. But having Jesus, we have everything we need. And so, Father, I pray that as we step out into a brand new week, that you would give us the grace to honor you, give us the grace to trust you. Give us the grace to fight this good fight of the faith, Lord. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. And Father, we commit ourselves and our lives and our days into your hands. We thank you for your precious promises that strengthen us and sustain us. Help us to bring glory and praise to you, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you.